thanks for coming to our inaugural virtual art club. Welcome. Thanks for joining us on Zoom here. Um, so I wanted to welcome you all and thanks for tuning in. And oh, as always, a special thank you to our Visionary Society members and our members of the museum for making programs like this happen. Without them, we wouldn't be able to be here right now. Um, so I did put a chat in the comments section in the chat box. So if you look at that, that's where you're able to type questions that you have during your presentation by um, Heather. And then you can also, if you would prefer to start um, talking verbally, all you have to do is hold down your space bar on your um, keyboard and you're able to chat and then unhold it if you want to stop talking. That's a really easy way to mute and unmute yourself. All right, sounds great. So without further ado, thanks for joining us. And today we have um, Heather, who is a local artist and teacher at Bradley University. And she's a painter, a sculptor, an installation artist whose work continues the function of childhood play into adulthood. So without further ado, Heather, if you wanna go ahead and start off and go ahead and share your presentation with us. Sure. Thank you, everybody. This is, uh, Zoom is very new to me, so um, bear with me. I did want to start with a website. Um, let's see. Can everyone see the Big Picture Peoria website? Yes. Good, okay. <laughs> I, I wanted to start with this website so I, I wouldn't forget. Um, thank you, Heather, and, and thank you, the Riverfront Museum, for letting me give this presentation. Uh, when Heather asked me to do the presentation, I said yes, and I thought, well, what I should talk about are things that people could go to and actually see right now, even in the sad times that we're living in when we can't interact with each other face to face. There's still a lot of artwork in Peoria that you can see. So in addition to things like the sculpture walk and uh, sculptures outside of the Riverfront Museum, Big Picture Peoria has put together a mural map. So if you are interested in seeing where these different murals are, you can use this website, bigpicturepeoria.org. And the map is right here, this blue button. So if you're, when you look at that, hit the blue button on this website and it will take you to an actual map. And if you click on any of these places on the map, it will show you, I was gonna look for mine, it will show you an image of the mural. I think it's this one. So this is one of the pieces that I'll talk about a little bit today. But you could see all of the different locations on this map where if you have a car, you can go see these things and experience them in person. So in addition to that mural, I have two other pieces in Peoria that you could visit, again, by car. Um, and so I'm going to talk about those. So let me switch over to my PowerPoint. Let's see, give me one moment. I think then start over. Okay, so. Okay, so can you nod if you see my PowerPoint slide right now? Okay, good, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> Uh, and so these are the three works that I'll talk about today. I'll talk about the first two the most. I probably could take more than half an hour, um, but this is, these are the three works that you could visit today in Peoria. And even when it's raining and snowing, I'll take people to these places and just sit in the car <laughs> so I can point them out to people. So the top two are at 1212 Southwest Adams. And then the bottom work is at 1800 Southwest Adams Street. Uh, so they're also not very far from each other. 
1212 Southwest Adams is on the two blocks where Big Picture Peoria holds their street festival every year. And so the, the, these two works are, were created for last year's street festival, but they're still on site. So they continue and um, they're, they are actually living, changing works of art, which I'll talk about a little bit. So those are the locations. And I'll start with this mural, which was a community mural that people actually painted on during the Big Picture Peoria Festival. So you could kind of see two different styles in the painting. And um, these areas where it looks kind of like a, a graffiti wall in a way, that's where people who visited the festival were able to paint whatever they wanted. So my idea for this mural, when I talked to Doug and Eileen, the, um, the founders of the festival, my idea was that I would create a mural that had what I call windows, these cut out areas where people could paint whatever they want. So that way there still was an overall image and a color palette that unified the whole mural, but they were able, anybody could paint. And what was amazing is that one, I think the very first person who painted on the mural was under two years old. <laughs> I mean, this was a very young person. <laughs> and so you can see, you can see evidence of that on the mural. And you can also see that there were lots of people at the festival. So I ended up having to tell people, just paint over what's there, just keep painting on it. And so it became this layered imagery that it was, it was very exciting to me. So I want to walk you through the process for creating this mural because um, you could go and, and visit the piece and experience it, but I wanna give you an insight into what went into making the work. So my first drawing looked like this and it was just a graphite drawing on paper. And when I do this kind of imagery, um, that it is pretty slow. It's kind of a slow meditative process where I'm creating these flowing organic forms that relate very much to the way things grow in nature. So the way that there's this uniform width of the line, it's kind of like vines that grow and then um, there are curls that are like tendrils and when you think about things that grow or um, organic forms, they're usually, they, they usually have a fullness because of the water that's in them that's giving them fullness and life. So when something dies, it kind of shrivels and contracts. But when something's growing, it has a fullness and it creates these full forms that also have um, create forms in the, the shapes around those forms that are also full and beautiful. So if you look at what we call the negative shapes in between the lines, those are also full fluid curvilinear organic forms. So it takes a while to, uh, to get these to a place where I think that they're really resolved. And what I like about this graphite drawing is you could see erasures and process of the drawing within it. Uh, I kind of made a crisper or a clearer black and white image to show the big picture of Peoria board uh, when I was proposing the mural, but I wasn't done then. There still was a lot of work to do. Um, so I, I did a lot more drawing, a lot more graphite drawing and then translated it into this digital image. So you can kind of see each time the image is changing. This has a different form up here. There's some more solid shapes here. Um, it's continually evolving and growing. And then this was the digital colorized version that I came up with before I started painting the mural. And um, my idea was that the color needed to be really vibrant, uh, very, very fun and interesting and inviting. 
but that these window forms that I was talking about needed to be clear. It should be clear where the places were that people could paint on. So that's why I made them kind of a blue sky. But that is not, the, this is not exactly what the final mural looked like either. So for this painting, I could have taken this image and I could have projected it onto the painting surface, but that's not really fun for me. So I chose to do what, what I do for any painting, um, which is I start out very, very loosely with loose gesture. So you might think that with an image that's been so tightly rendered, like this drawing, this digital drawing, that projecting might be the better way to go. For me, um, a part of the fun of making a painting is being able to stay loose and gestural. And you can create a very hard edged image still being loose and gestural. And then in the end, the painting has more of a life to it and it doesn't feel uh, stiff. I never want something that I make to feel like it was tedious to make. So it's important that I have fun while I'm making it. So I use this, this image as a reference, but um, this you could see is I'm really just starting really loosely, wiping on very thin paint, and then wiping off. There's erasure, there's um, a lot of fixes in here, revisions, and then I just kept revising it as I went. And this was an idyllic time in my life when I got to paint this mural. So what you're seeing here is behind my house, there's kind of a paved parking area and then my garage. And there's wisteria growing on the, the fence next to the garage. And I, I just rigged up some boards against the side of the garage that I could fix these panels to. And the panels for the mural Big Picture Peoria provided these alpha panels, which has aluminum on either side and a polyethylene core. So they're very thin and light, but they're very stable. So it's not easy to bend them. Um, they're really a great mural surface. So I had these up on the, the side of my garage and my neighbor enjoyed washing dish dishes because she could look out and watch me painting and the mural changing. And the neighbors, when they walked down the alleyways, they could also see it. And my neighbors on the other side had kids that were watching me paint this mural. And so, like I said, this, this was just, I was able to paint outdoors as much as I want. This was just a really, really enjoyable time in my life making this mural. So here you can see I'm building up a little bit more, um, but with pretty transparent paint. So watered down, I'm using house paint, a very high quality house paint, um, but just watered down and thin. And um, it's a process, it's like drawing in that it's just building gradually um, and working all across the whole picture plane. So I don't just start on one side and move gradually to, to the other side. I'm working the whole surface all at once and bouncing around back and forth um, across the image. So here's a detail, a closer detail of the, the in-process photo I just showed you. And you can see it's so thin, the paint is so thin, it's almost like watercolor where you can see through uh, and this was very, this was a very alluring uh, state that the painting was in. It's tempting sometimes to keep images when they're in, in progress because it has, a, it just has a, a very, um, it has a quality where it's very full of life. But um, it, as it, as the, as it grows and uh, the paint starts to get built up, that, that also is very rewarding. Um, but it's, I'm glad that that I'm able to show you the process images so you could see the various states that it went through. So here it's a bit more built up and you can see there's still evidence of me changing things, changing my mind. Um, in the sketch there was an opening up at the top here 
that I decided, well, that, that needs to be closed. I want the whole form to be sort of one cloud-like image. Um, and then I decided there's a few dots outside. I still kind of want to add more of those dots around the outside of the painting. And I might do that. I think I probably will. Uh, but here, so it's changing and growing. Um, and this is where it is on site right now. And this was it set up for the festival. So this is what it looks like at 1212 Adams right now. And of course, right over here is my installation, which I'll also talk about and which you still can see. So on the day of the festival, uh, this was all set up and uh, I put down some drop cloths and I had paint over here and people would come up and I would just help them get started with the painting. So here, this is a good image because you can see the, the age range that participated from the, the toddlers and the grade school kids to adults who also were having fun and being thoughtful about what they would add to this image. So this was really a, a rewarding experience for me. And then in the end, it was that it was really packed with imagery, like I said before. Um, and so what I was thinking is, well, maybe those windows, those spaces could be painted again. And that is currently the plan for this mural that it will travel to a high school in, in Tremont and the students will design paintings to go inside these little windows and those will get repainted. So if you go to 1212 uh, Adams right now, I actually have sanded out uh, the windows here. They were um, ideally without the coronavirus situation, they would be at the high school right now, but they're not in school and we don't know. Um, but fortunately, they're still just very secure. They, they're attached to some wooden structures that are attached to an iron fence. So they're still very secure right now. And then after those high school students paint on them, uh, we hope that the mural will travel to different buildings. So I'm hoping I can display it on some buildings on Bradley's campus, for example. Uh, but then they might uh, stay at the high school and be displayed there for a while. But then maybe we'll use them at a future festival and repaint the windows. It's something that can uh, be constantly changing. So it's, I like the idea that there is an ongoing evolution with this work. And that's what I mean when I say that it's living and growing. So in addition to the mural that I did for Big Picture, I also created an installation. And what I'm showing you right now with this image is the site before the installation. So I talked to Doug and Eileen, again, uh, the big picture Peoria founders uh, and the organizers of the festival. And I said, yeah, I really would like to do an art installation as well. And they wanted something large and colorful and I like to do outdoor installations that are very playful and very colorful uh, and inviting. So I walked the, these two blocks on Southwest Adams and these poles here just were calling to me. This is a flagpole with a big spotlight on it. And this was a signpost, uh, but this triangular shape in particular next to this taller flagpole there, it looked like uh, masts of a ship. It looked like, well, we really should hang things on there and build things around it. <laughs> and so Doug and Eileen uh, got permission for me to make an installation on this site. And it is um, somewhat temporary uh, in that it's, it's going to be in place indefinitely, basically. And so, um, it's, it might also grow and change. We've talked about me adding to it and changing it for the next Big Picture Peoria Festival. So here's a, view, a different view of those uh, poles plus the lamp post on the street next to the site. 
So I wondered too, well, maybe I can involve the lamp post and I was able to. But uh, as an installation, you have to think about the whole environment and how your work is going to fit into the space. So this is what the space looked like. You can see a lot of overgrown shrubs and trees that have sprung up. So first I really needed to clear the site. So this is me clearing all of that and creating uh, a cleaner environment for the installation. What was wonderful about this opportunity is that I didn't have to make things at home and then bring them to the site. There was lots of room for me to make the work right on site and there was even outdoor electricity so I could use my chop saw on site. So these are, I painted these blue boards outside um, and that's what I used to build this structure that is built around the lamp post and the sign post. So both of these were already really solid structures that have what you would expect a very solid base in concrete and really thick, heavy pieces of iron holding those in place. So it was a perfect way for me to build a really strong, stable structure for my installation. So this is sort of, it, it's very reminis reminiscent of a tree house, of course, but it also has some references to a ship. And, um, and then as I started working on the installation, I think a lot about water and the movement of water. So this tree house ship, also started to have a waterfall, <laughs> a, an abstract waterfall. So there's some um, plastic tubing and garden hoses that cascade down from that, that treehouse platform. The treehouse, you can't climb up here um, unless you have this tall of a ladder. That, so I made it such that with this ladder, I could lean the ladder up here and climb up to get to the platform, but you would have to be a, really a gymnast to be able to get up there without a ladder. So that was for safety reasons, of course. I would love to just build playground, a playground that people could play on, and that's a dream of mine to do someday. So um, I, I did as much as I could from the ground and with the ladder, but then because of big picture Peoria's uh, sponsorship, uh, we were able to get Sunrise, Sunbelt Rentals uh, loaned this, donated the loan of this JLG lift, which has this basket. It's like a big machine with this big basket that you can lift up to get way up high on a structure. So this was essential for building the, the uppermost parts of the installation. And I had been on one of these before to do a rooftop project, but I'd never actually driven one myself. So that was a lot of fun. I, uh, I've used scissor lifts, but this was sort of at the next level for me. It was, it was great fun. And it's actually quite safe because um, when you're in the bucket, you have straps that you strap yourself into and attach to the bucket, it's a lot safer actually than climbing on ladders, but you can get 30 feet in the air. So I estimate that this is about 30 feet tall, um, going all the way up to this flag post. And um, what's really, what really brought it all together was this orange tubing that I used to highlight the very, the top parts of the installation. And of course, orange against blue, that's a very strong complementary color contrast. But in addition to that, the orange tubing is kind of translucent and a really vivid color. So when it catches sunlight, it really glows. It's just, it becomes so luminous. And then even against a cloudy sky, it's, it's very, it's really vivid, it's really vibrant. And I tell people that I'm lucky as an installation artist when I work outside because the sky is a part of my artwork then. And so if you get to visit this, if you get to visit, um, what I recommend is if you're able to get out of your car and walk around it, see if you can get, if, if you're able to walk underneath it, like if you're comfortable doing that, it's, it's safe to do so. 
but get all the way underneath and look up at it because this is what this is the kind of thing that you'll see but it's different every day because the sky is different every day so on a sunny day with these glowing lines it's to me it's just it's so uplifting it, it's it's kind of transforming and this plastic tubing came from a dumpster at Bradley University. So I felt good about upcycling a lot of the garden, well, the, all of the garden hose and the artwork also is upcycled. And then the PEX tubing that I use, the plastic tubing, that's something that I use in installations a lot, but I never throw it away. I'm always reusing it for the next installation. So this, this piece also will grow and change, hopefully at 12, 12, 12 for a while, but certainly Sunday it will come down, but then the pieces will be uh, recycled and used for future artworks. So um, now we're on to uh, the mural that's at UFS in Peoria. Um, and so that's at 1800 Southwest Adams. And here you see there's two murals at that site. And I worked with the owner, the UFS owner, Pierre uh, Serafin. And first I, um, I arranged for my student, my student at the time, Michael Brown, to paint this image right here on the left. So Mike at the time was a graduate student in painting. And he was making uh, lots of paintings in the studio on canvases. Um, so easel paintings, but he had a history as a graffiti artist. And we had talked a lot about how graffiti art influenced his own, his own artwork and if he could bring that into his work for it that he was going to in, uh, show at galleries. And he was always uncomfortable with that idea because um, in the graffiti world, it's, you don't bring street art into the gallery. <laughs> Um, so when Pierre contacted me asking, hey, can you, do you have someone who will paint big mural, a big mural for me? I turned to Mike about it and we ended up giving him course credit to do this huge mural. It's 20 feet tall, his is 20 feet tall and 50 feet wide. And it was just, he, he enjoyed doing it so much. Um, and it was a part of his thesis exhibition and, um, and when he was finished, I really wanted to paint a mural next to his. <laughs> and so that's what I did. Uh, and this, this mural next to his um, is called, We Are All Made of Light. And if you, so if you visit this piece, again, if you're able to get out of your car and walk close, um, you'll be able to see that the title of the work, it's, it's hidden right here. Um, you won't be able to see it on your screen, but maybe you could see a tiny bit of the purple over the brown. It's just meant to be a subtle way of telling people who visit the site what the title is without making it too obvious. So the We Are All Made of Light is an image that has a lot of luminosity. You can see a lot of the same fluid organic forms as there are in my um, big picture. Peoria mural at the other location. But for this painting, I was really a lot more free and I, I improvised. There was, there was no sketch for this painting. It was the ideal situation because Pierre didn't even care what I was going to paint on there as long as it was family friendly. So I got to, I painted what I want, I improvised, and I made it up as I went, which is just the most fun that I could have and 20 feet tall. So I was using a scissor lift for this one. This is an, a graduate student of mine, Hattie Lee, walking in front of the mural to give the sense of scale. So I didn't include all my process uh, photos for this one, but you could see from different angles, from different viewpoints, you see different aspects of the painting. I worked on three different surfaces. So there's some flatter cement block, some brick, and then there's this other kind of block texture over here on the right. And um, graffiti, I realized, I learned a lot because graffiti artists, one of the reasons that they use spray paint 
is because you don't have to paint inside all those cracks on those different surfaces. But I didn't have time to, to learn how to become a spray paint artist and I, it was a challenge and I love challenges. So I figured out how to make it work uh, with painting uh, by, with a brush. And one thing that I did um, is I stained the whole surface so that those little cracks would get filled in with just at least a stain of paint. And then, so on this detail here, you could see those cracks got filled in with color, but then what I painted on top, it doesn't, I didn't have to always go back and fill in all those little blanks. And what the effect that that gives, it also, it kind of gives it a, a mosaic effect in a way. Um, because if you were doing an image in mosaic, you would have colors, but there's the separations in between the mosaic pieces. So I learned so much from all of these different experiences. And um, as an artist, it's always important for me to keep learning and growing and challenging myself. So thank you very much to UFS and Pierre and to Big Picture Peoria for giving me these opportunities. They, they've just been invaluable. and. Um, Big Picture Peoria, they have continued, even in this time when we're all um, isolated, they continue to just work tires, tirelessly to plan for the future and um, make sure that we keep the arts alive in Peoria. And I know that's important to all of you. So uh, I put on here the Big Picture Peoria website, my own website and um, my Instagram tag, handle, whatever it's called, at HGM Braumeyer. So if you visit these, um, these locations with the artwork, and you, if you snap some photos or take some selfies with them, if you tag me at HGM Braumeyer, then I'll get to see you with the artwork. So that's my presentation, um, and I think we can open it up to questions. So if anyone has questions, feel free to um, unmute yourself either by holding down the space bar on your keyboard or um, I might just go ahead and unmute everyone that way we can. Mm -hmm. So you can make comments as well. Doesn't yes. always have any questions. <laughs> yes, feel free to either make comments or you can type if you don't want to talk out loud, you can type in the chat box. And we'll see well, that. Thank, thank you for this. This was really fun to hear about the process from the artist. How long did it take you to do the mural, Heather? So the, the big picture Peoria mural that uh, the community got to paint on, um, I started sketches uh, long before I actually started the painting. And just the drawing process took probably weeks. Um, and then the painting process, I worked on it for, I think, a couple months. Um, and then this, the UFS mural, the 20 foot tall mural, that I, I also made uh, in a couple months. But the strange thing about that one is they were, they were month, two months that were separated from each other. I started painting in May of last year and I painted all May. But the thing about that month is we had thunderstorms almost every other day. Um, and then I went away for the summer and came back. Uh, and so then I, I had to finish up the big picture Peoria projects. I finally got back to the UFS mural and spent another full month. And at that point I got the scissor lift. So I was able to do the upper portions of that, that mural. Wow. And I'm wondering, you know, with the Michael Brown mural and yours, they've fit together really well. Can you talk about the concept of how you, how you did that since his was created first? Yes. And Mike and I talked about it. It was nice that I was able to know uh, Mike and talk about what he wanted for our murals being next to each other. As a graffiti artist, he's used to working on permission, they call it permission walls, where anybody can go and paint graffiti, um, and also working in teams with other graffiti artists. And the situation will often be one long wall, 
but each artist blends their work into the next person's. There's never a sharp distinction from one to the other. So when Mike found out that I was going to do a mural next to his, he really encouraged me to blend the two. In fact, he told me to paint over his. And I, I, I was very hesitant to do that, mostly because um, if I painted over his too much and didn't like it, he had, he, was, um, he had moved to California, so he wouldn't be able to come back and add back in. So what I tried to do instead is I tried to make it look like he had painted over to my side. Uh, and so I brought in particular some, some pinks and some really strong perspective lines. I just brought that over onto my side and then built out from there. So that was how I, I merged the imagery of those two. And our hope um, just in, in general um, for that wall is that more artists will be adding artwork all over the wall um, and that those artists also will continue to blend imagery. I have a question. Hi, Bob. Uh, hi. <laughs> uh, I noticed that in both of these pieces, they almost look like there's some elements of mazes in them. Yeah. <laughs> dead ends, and then you go around, and you come around, and there's dead ends. Is that, am I not thinking about that right? Or you are absolutely thinking of it right. And I have, I have been doing that maze-like imagery uh, for a long time. And um, I actually, it comes out looking maze-like, but one thing that I'm thinking about is like a, a little bug or a worm tunneling underground. And in, in uh, textile design, those are called vermicular patterns. Um, and the line becomes, it's monolinear because of the width of the worm or the width of the bug. <laughs> and it's, so it's like this kind of slow traveling and tunnel, tunneling and carving out space. And so it's not literally, uh, about bugs, but um, it's it's a it's a similar process because I'm, I'm mentally I'm just moving through space and carving out these paths and tunnels and places um, for the eye to go and for the mind to go. I, I had an ant farm when I was a kid that was kind of. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I've, uh, I'm fascinated by your installation art because you um, obviously did a really wonderful piece there. But if somebody were interested in working with you uh, for a collaborative uh, effort, um, how do we go about uh, uh, being informed that you're doing something that you might want other people to be involved in? Uh, what do you mean? Oh, do you mean like if if the audience were adding to the work? Is that what you mean? Yes. Yeah. If there was a, a participation by others, uh, how would we? I guess if you were doing a new piece or adding to that piece and you wanted the public involved, how, yeah. How would you let them know? Outside of the festival itself. Um, that would be that would be really tough, and that's something that I haven't undertaken yet. So I would have to think about. How okay. I would manage that, yeah, and and usually, I mean, um, I guess I did a I did something that had some aspects of that when I collaborated with a graduate student on an installation outside of the Hoyser Art Center on Bradley's campus. We were do, we did a constantly changing, evolving installation outside the art building, and just because they we, we had no. Um, there was no secure way to protect it from people adding to, to it. Anybody really could have. And actually someone ended up putting in, uh, we were using similar types of imagery, bright, colorful um, plastic objects, putting it all together. Someone put an orange traffic cone in the work and, and it was intentional to add to the work. <laughs> but, you know, so there is, as an installation, Artist, if you're working outside and in the public arena, you you know and you accept that people could add to it or take away from it, and it might be well intentioned or it might be ill intentioned. 
uh, I'm not, I don't worry as much about that as I uh, worry about safety. And so what I do is I always use my own body and I, I pull on things and I hang on things and I push them and I, I make sure that um, it would be really tough to hurt yourself. And then I, there's also a stewardship that I, you have to, if you don't have someone else checking on it, you have to be checking on it. And so it does need a, a slight repair right now. I, I, I go every so often and walk around it and, and hit it and look at it. Um, the, when we had that tornado go by in recent weeks, a couple things did come loose. So I'm gonna go over there with a ladder and, and re-secure those things. But yeah, anybody, anybody could rip it apart, uh, but it would take a lot of work. And people usually, I, I've had very good luck with, I've had installations outside um, for up to three years. And any, any damage is just from like some gradual breakdown or maybe somebody did hang on some of the tubing, but I don't ever see that as ill-intentioned. Yeah, cool. Heather, I've got another question. Um, when I think of some the, some of your work that I have seen, and I compare it to like a lot of artists create something and then it's sacred to them. They don't want other people to do anything with it. But you have a history of doing pieces that you asked the public to collaborate. Years ago, there was a installation show at the Gateway Building, and you had a piece of fabric and scissors hanging, and <laughs> people destroyed what somebody would say was a beautiful piece of artwork. So how did you get to the mindset that collaboration is something you want in your art? Uh, I, I was introduced to, to artists collaborating with each other when I worked at Interlochen Center for the Arts up in Michigan, um, where there's all these amazing artists come together and teach young people. And they came from all kinds of um, really great art institutions. And so I learned a lot from the artists there about the benefits of collaboration and that a part of it is accepting that what you do could be completely obliterated or changed or painted over or taken away. And while that sounds really threatening to a lot of people, when you actually engage in that, it you realize, oh, it's actually quite freeing because it actually takes away a lot of pressure and you can be you can be very um, you can be very free about about the choices that you make because you think well it's not permanent this is all this is all temporary and of course that's something that is true of everything around us and um, it's something to remind us ourselves of with the the COVID nineteen pandemic is this this is temporary. Um, but as an artist, too, uh, a lot of people do get really hung up on something lasting forever. But even with the most archival methods, uh, you know, centuries down the line, conservators are going to have to be working on it if it lasts that long. Personally, um, once I'm gone from this world, I'm not that concerned about my artwork still being around. But a bunch of it probably will be. But while I'm here, I it's really important for me to, to do really big things. And without a million dollars or $2 million, it, that, also, that often has to be temporary. So part of it also is giving myself the opportunity to make things that are really big and uh, just accepting that it, they'll probably be disassembled at some point. So there's a lot of acceptance involved um, and in, in my artwork, I'm very good at accepting. I need to take that into the other areas of my life. <laughs> so thank you for asking about that. Anything else? All right, well, I think we'll go ahead and end it there. Thank you so much, Heather, for joining us today and being a part of our inaugural virtual art club. Uh, we'll be virtual next month as well um, and for this foreseeable future. So if you do want the email, so you can shoot me an email. Um, my email is listed in the chat box there, hplaco at pureriverfrontmuseum.org. And you can join our email list. 
if you would like an email directly to you. Otherwise, I will post our Zoom link to our Facebook event and to our website. So thank you again for coming today. And it was very fun and we look forward to Thank you, everybody. One. I miss you. <laughs> Good to see everyone. <laughs> All right. We thank will. We will yeah. see you, you next time. Stuff, stuff. We'll do it physically. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks, PRM, for doing this. This is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Of course. Bye. <laughs>